Uh, and Susan is many things here, uh, living history volunteer coordinator, uh, great researcher, she presents here often, uh, but most recently she is the recipient of the Washington State Historical Society's David Douglas Award. That's, they give that to one person in the state, I believe. And that has a lot to do with, uh, with this book and this whole research project. Um, I'll just read a little from the award um, real quick. So the David Douglas Award recognizes the significant contribution of an individual that, infor um, that informs or expands appreciation of Washington State history and the award, 2022 award went to Susan Monahan. It says, last year Susan published her book on local architecture, Walla Walla Past and Present. Her research became a record-breaking lecture at Fort Walla Walla Museum with 168 in attendance. You're a little more comfortable today. Um, her work became an exhibit displayed at the museum and at a local retirement community. A teacher who was excited by her talk and book asked Susan to share what she knew with her fifth grade highly capable class. Susan gave them a walking tour of Walla Walla, engaging the kids with fascinating stories about the buildings, their architects, and the many diverse lives lived within them. Susan's tours and presentations are in high demand because she makes history compelling. With this architect project in particular, people walk away with fresh eyes that start to see the rich history and the physical environment around them daily. They begin to pay closer attention, learn more, and see themselves connected to that past as they work to shape the future. So hopefully you walk away like that uh, too after today. So congratulations, Susan, and thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let me know if I'm doing okay with the mic. What do you think? So far, so good? Okay. Uh, about uh, several months ago, Ella Myers, who works here at the museum, said to Steve and to me, I want you to do an after hours presentation, please, for us. And I said, what's the topic? And she said, you choose. <laughs> so Steve and I talked about it, and since we're so fond of the historic homes of Walla Walla, we decided to each choose one and do it in depth tonight for you. I chose the Isaacs home on Brookside Drive, and he chose the Langdon home on Isaacs Avenue. So we'll be talking about those tonight, and that's why we call it A Tale of Two Houses. There's the Isaac's house, and there is the Langdon house. So get out of We discovered when we just started discussing it and doing our planning, right off the bat, we said, oh, our houses have a very significant link, one to the other, with the residents of the house. Maybe you figured that out already. It's not because one of them is the Isaacs house on Brookside and the other is the Langdon house on Isaacs. It's not that simple. It's a little more complicated. And if you haven't figured it out, that's okay. It will be revealed later. I'm going to start because my house is older. The Isaacs House on Brookside Drive. This photo taken by Steve on a snowy day. Here's another view of the Isaacs House. It has many facets. So one needs to go all around it to see all of its different features. Brookside Drive, where is it? Is it a street? Not really. Is it an alley? It's more than that. I'm on uh, Boyer here, and I'm going east, and I'm going to discover Brookside Drive. It's between Boyer and Isaacs. I'm turning down a very, very intriguing little lane, and I come upon the Isaacs home. There's lots of foliage, lots of shrubs, many angles. Hard to get close up. This is a view of it probably about the turn of the century. This is definitely many years after it was first built. And we're going to talk about who lived here. This is two of the Isaacs' daughters. They had three. I don't know which two. I can speculate probably Bessie 
and Maddie. Steve and I would have loved to have put this house in our book, but there's no way that we could replicate this angle in this day and age. Brookside Drive used to be out in the middle of nowhere with no houses around, and now it has houses on both sides. And to get this particular angle, we'd probably have to take the photo from like somebody's kitchen or something. It just wouldn't be possible. The people who lived here were H.P. and Lucy Isaacs, and their five children, Grace and Bessie and Maddie and John and Edwin. I have pictures, photos of Grace and Bessie. I could find none of Maddie or John or Edwin, so I just substituted pictures of people that I figure probably looked like them. <laughs> it was one of our earliest homes, built in 1865, but it did not look like this at the beginning. The story is that it was built of adobe, and very small scale, and very modest. And then over the years, it's added to, enlarged, bumped up, bumped out. But the, at some of the walls actually still have adobe at their core, or so it is said. Who was H.P. Isaacs? That's Henry Perry Isaacs. Why, how, why was he so wealthy? How did he achieve so much? He was a mill owner. He had farms, he grew wheat, and then he had a flour mill. The North Pacific flour mill was just one of his mills. North Pacific flour mill was on the edge of town, but actually it's in the same place where Wildwood Park is today. So when you walk by Wildwood Park, think about Henry Perry Isaacs and his flour mill. He was a man with a lot of vision. He was the first person in the area to trade with China, to sell wheat to China, which seems remarkable to me that early. He's the person that established Walla Walla's first water system in 1866. This was not a fancy affair. It was a couple of tanks, a lot of water, and wooden pipes. That's right, poured out logs were the pipes. It got most, more sophisticated later, but at the beginning, it was pretty crude. Why would he be the person to establish the, the Walla Walla Water Company? Well, he was a wealthy man with a lot of land and a lot of water rights. So it, it made sense for him to do that. His son, John Isaacs, later became the head of the Walla Walla Water Company. By that time, it had become much more sophisticated. There were reservoirs and tanks and much better pipes. H.P. Isaac donated the land onto which the Odd Fellows Home for Widows and Orphans was built in 1897. He could grant them the land because he had so much and because he had so many water rights he was able to promise them 400 gallons a day for their needs. There was, by the way, a big competition for where the Odd Fellows home was going to be. Tacoma was in the running, but Walla Walla won. The reason they needed so much water was they had orchards and cows and chickens and a, a big vegetable garden. Edwin Isaacs was his son also, and he was instrumental in the development of the Walla Walla Traction Company, the streetcar system. We're going to look at the 1900 census of the Isaacs family, and we see that even as adults, several of his children are still living with Lucy and Henry in the Brookside home. This is actually the last year that Henry would be in the census report because he died in 1900. We see that Grace, their oldest daughter, is still with them, and Edwin, and John, and then Edwin's wife, Eloise. Maddie and Bessie have married and moved on. But I want you to notice down at the bottom of the list, we see Jin. Jin was a Chinese servant 
It was a domestic. And as we know, many wealthy people in town had Chinese domestics. The Isaacs would have entertained a lot, club meetings, organization meetings, lots of get-togethers and parties at their home. And the newspaper would often report that dainty refreshments were served. And you can be sure that any food that was served was prepared by Jin, the Chinese domestic. Lucy and Grace and Bessie, Isaacs were all tireless suffragists. And you know the beautiful thing about the Isaacs family is that Henry P. and the brothers would have also described themselves as suffragists. It wasn't just women in that family. In fact, Bessie Isaacs, one of the daughters, met her future husband at a convention for women's suffrage in Portland and left town to do her work elsewhere. You probably have all heard that Susan B. Anthony came to Walla Walla. She actually came three times. The first time was in 1871 and was by far her most interesting visit. This is what happened. She's from Rochester, New York, and she had a friend there whose son worked in a bar in Umatilla. Miss Anthony, you are going to go tour the Northwest would you please stop in Umatilla and give my love to my son? Miss Anthony said of course she would do that. She stopped at the bar, and then a story goes with that visit. It true, perhaps, not true, perhaps, that while she was there, she sipped a glass of wine. And we need to remember that at the time, the suffragist movement Uh -oh. paired with, I'm just going to project my very best, um, was often paired with the temperance movement. Well, the story about Susan B. Anthony and her glass of wine traveled to Walla Walla even faster than Susan B. Anthony did. And by the time she arrived in Walla Walla, all those church ladies who were planning to support her and host her and be, thank you, and be good to her, had changed their minds because she had had that wine in Umatilla. However, who welcomed her to their home and had her sleep there? The Isaacs family on Brookside. It would be appropriate if we had a plaque that went on the Brookside home that said, Susan B. Anthony slept here because she did. Lucy and Grace and Bessie were also had a close relationship with Abigail Scott Dunaway, who was kind of the Susan B. Anthony of the Northwest, a, a, a remarkable suffragist. She and especially Lucy Fulton Isaacs, the mother, had a very had ongoing conversations with letters, and they would often meet each other and talk. This is a quote from one of Abigail Scott Dunaway's letter, which I like very much. Do not be discouraged at the apathy you meet in Walla Walla. The faithful will always do the work. It is better so. Hoping to see you soon, hopefully and lovingly, Abigail Scott Dunaway. There was a Walla Walla Woman's Club that was established in 1866, and at first its purpose was just self-improvement and mutual interchange of ideas, but the time was right, wasn't it, for it to become the focus was suffrage for women. So very soon, the name was changed to the Equal Suffrage League, and it maintained its organization until the vote finally uh, was made, it was put into the Constitution by the 19th Amendment. Bessie Isaacs, the second daughter, was perhaps the most energetic and enthusiastic of the suffragists. She would speak all over the state, even after she was married. She unfortunately died rather young. 
But the Seattle Post Intelligencer reported that she gave a passionate speech reviewing the movement's accomplishments, advising women to join organizations, and to influence those around them. We have to remember, of course, that just because the newspapers reported what someone said did not mean that they necessarily agreed with her. In 1907, a very, very important event occurred at the Isaacs home on Brookside. The Walla Walla Symphony was established. Now, the Walla Walla Symphony in the beginning brought in some guest artists, but most of the musicians were indeed volunteers. They paid the conductor, but all the other work was done by volunteers. The programming, the choosing of what pieces to play, the venues where they would be played, and it was also a club. The symphony was a club, so that like-minded people who loved music could get together and just talk about it and hear examples of different pieces. A musician herself, Grace Isaacs, the first daughter, was an active member in the Walla Walla Symphony. This newspaper article tells about the time she presented a paper to the club on the development of opera. I'm going to talk a lot about Grace Isaacs because she was my favorite, and because I think she was an exemplary person and contributed so very, very much to Walla Walla as a community. She lived from 1875 to 1936. She graduated from the Whitman Conservatory of Music, and then she went on to Mills College where she got her bachelor's degree, as did her sister Bessie. She was fortunate, she was wealthy enough to travel to Europe and she used those experiences of, of her European travel in a lot of her organizations later. It really enriched her and enriched others because she brought it back and shared her experiences. Sorry, I pushed too hard. That's right. In 1894, the Reading Club, Walla Walla Reading Club, was established. Grace was a founding member. In 1898, the Art Club was established, and Grace was a founding member. The Art Club still meets, and I know because my friend Diana Schmidt invited me to one of their meetings. In 1898, the Red Cross was established. Grace Isaacs was the second. Grace Isaacs was drives. These were advertised in the paper, highly organized, where men would get together with their guns. Rabbits were a pest, it is true, and they would go and just shoot them in gardens and farms, often just wounding them, leaving them to starve. And the Humane Society was very opposed to that. They offered an alternative, which was rabbit wire, and that was helpful, definitely, in ending the drives. Also, Grace was chosen as the member of the Humane Society to go to schools and talk to children about the humane treatment of animals, which was rather a foreign idea at the time to many. <laughs> Probably the thing that Grace was most proud of in terms of organizations in her whole life was the Women's Park Club. What happened was that we had no city park. It was 1906 and 7, and we had a beautiful design by John Langdon, who Steve will tell you more about later. He drew a design for the park that we have today. There is a myth, a much loved story, but not necessarily true, that our park was designed by the same man that designed Central Park in New York. Not possible, but that was Frederick Law Olmsted, and he was dead. <laughs> so that was not he. Uh, his son did come to Walla Walla, invited by Stephen Penrose, Steve will tell you more about that later. 
but he did not design the park. He gave some advice, and he went back east to Brookline, Massachusetts. Well, Grace Isaac looked around, and she said, we've got to have a park. And she and John Langdon went to the city council. They showed John Langdon's design. The city council said, it's beautiful. We love it. We will give you no money at all. You don't have any. So Grace decided to establish the Women's Park Club and start raising funds. She recruited a lot of very important, prominent women in the community to be in the Women's Park Club, which was very, very helpful. This is the actual photo of the Minutes book, which is at Whitman College Archives. And in it, you'll see names like Drumheller, Blaylock, Baker, um, Kirk, uh, Kirkman, definitely, and Keeler. So these were prominent women in the community, and they would be very, very helpful in raising funds. Well, if you need to finance a park, you need a campaign. And John Langdon came up with the idea of buttons. These were actually like pins. And on each of them, he had them printed in Portland. On each of them was a little picture of his design. And the little slogan that said, for a city park. They happened to be the same size as a silver dollar, and that's how much they cost. At first, he took them to local merchants. They sold some, but they didn't sell enough. Then he took them to schools, told children to sell them. They sold some, they didn't sell enough. That's when Grace Isaacs and the Women's Park Club got involved. They agreed, these prominent ladies, to go door to door, knock on the door, ask to see the gentleman of the house. If he had no button, he bought one. And if they ran into a gentleman on the street and looked at his lapel and there was no button there, he bought one. They were not interested in stories such as, oh, it's at home on the dresser. If he didn't have a button, he bought a button. Things were moving along pretty well, but there was still need of a lot more money. So Women's Park Club organized something called <clears throat> Hermeses, it's a Dutch word for entertainment or music and, and a really exciting events, dancing, singing, concerts, some of them at, at Keeler Great Theater, and they sold lots of tickets for these, and they had more than one. And believe it or not, they earned a lot of money. Park Club is elated, said one newspaper article, because they had raised over $4,000. At, at one Kermis. They had card parties. You had to pay to get in to play cards. But, as the newspaper said, play cards to buy grass seed. This was the only way we were going to get a park. This is a photograph of Grace Isaacs in 1909, the year after the park opened. That was the year the bandstand went in in the, in the children's playground. I'm sure this was a very, very proud and happy moment for her. I do want you to notice the trees. <laughs> Little spindly things that they are. Quite an accomplishment. And of course, I'm such a Grace Isaacs fan that on Arbor Day, the Parks Department had a great event several years ago. And there I am, reenacting Grace Isaacs, which I also do at the Living History Program. Because as I said, she's one of my favorites. On the side, what did she do? How did she have the side? But she sold real estate on the side. This is one of the houses that she sold. One year she was worth over $3,000, the city directory said, which is pretty significant for a woman at the time. She never married. And these were her very important outlets to her. Her pursuits were not all intellectual. When she was 30 years old, she climbed Mount Rainier with Professor Anderson and another young woman. She was a photographer and a painter. She won a bronze medal at a C 
Seattle competition for her oil painting, California Afternoon. As I said before, we needed that plaque for Susan B. Anthony slept here on the Isaacs home. Well, I think we need more than one plaque. There's the water company, the city park, the art club, the reading club, the symphony. All, all began in the Brookside home. And at different times, if we were to affix all of these plaques, to the Isaacs home, it might look something like this. <laughs> I think you will agree with me that the Isaacs family and the Brookside home had a very, very important part in the de development of our community. And that's what I know about the house on Brookside Drive belonged to the Isaacs. Thank you. When we ran through this, this morning we, we did a read-through of everything, and I timed out at 50 minutes, so I had to go home and make a lot of changes. So I'm going to rely more on my notes. I did, the last time I read it through at my house, it was only 30 minutes. I can't promise that for tonight. I think Mike needs to be a little... A little closer? Oh, there we go. All right. Now, how many people recognize this building? Most of you. Well, that was probably a dumb question. Uh, I hope you're not all beta members here. <laughs> how many in this room are old enough to remember what it looked like before 1957? Uh-oh, only one. <laughs> you can collect your prize at the door on the way out. Uh, do you, and of course you, of course, know who it was built for because that's already been revealed. Well, it was a magnificent home. Uh, you say go. Oh, go. 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 She's clicking for me. It was the magnificent home of John and Felinda Green Langdon shortly after its completion in 1905. And you can see John with his sons Warren and John standing in the front yard. Uh, it was an imposing structure, and it was the largest home constructed in Walla Walla, at least up to that time, and it could possibly still hold that record had it not been drunk to here. Oh, yeah. This is a 2016 view of the house looking toward the northwest. And I cannot offer any suggestion as to what the polar bear chain to the front porch signifies. <laughs> Beta's idea of day four, I guess. Uh, and this is a similar view to what you just saw. This time, Belinda and the two boys are in the photograph. This is a portrait of John Langdon that was used by Professor W.D. Lyman in his History of Old Walla Walla County that was published in 1980. And these are portraits of both John and Felinda. We don't have a date for Felinda, but she looks quite young. John's was dated 1922, so four years older than the one you just saw. And here we see John Langdon standing in the Baker Langdon Apple Orchard. This was published in Up to the Times Magazine in June of 19, did I lose it? Oh yes, it's dark over there again. I'll keep going for a moment. It was published in the June 1912 issue of Up, the, up to the Times. And I guess we can leave that off for a while. Are we up? Yep. So who was John Warren Langdon? 
In his day, he could be considered a true Renaissance man, yet he's not as well remembered today as many early Walla Wallas. John was born in New Hampton, Iowa in December of 1871 to Warren W. and Hester R. Langdon. The parents relocated to Moscow, Idaho when John was a small boy and where he attended school. Eventually, though, he left uh, Moscow and enrolled at the Bishop Scott Grammar School in Portland, Oregon, where he was the head of his class, received the headmaster's prize after prize after achieving the highest marks of any Bishop Scott student to date in his 17 years of existence. He was also cited for excellence in deportment and penmanship. At age 16, John returned to Moscow and went to work for the First National Bank where his father was vice president. However, at age 18, he accepted an, a position in Walla Walla with the Dorsey Baker estate. At, at the age of 28, he became secretary of Baker and Baker Loan Company. Warren and Hester Langdon also settled in Walla Walla, Warren becoming superintendent of the Walla Walla Waterworks. Many of you are familiar with Greens Park addition to the city of Walla Walla with its many historic homes. Uh, it was planted by Mary F. Green in 1903 as part of the extensive properties she and her late husband, William O. Green, had uh, acquired as early settlers here in Walla Walla. John Langdon and Philinda Green, Mary Green's daughter, were married in 1897. Mary Green transferred all of her properties, uh, all of the property comprising Green Park Addition, to the Green Investment Company in 1909, and she remained president until her death in 1911. On December 24th, 1904, Mary Green sold lot six, seven, and eight in block 11 of Green's Park Edition to Philinda for one dollar. That presumably generous Christmas gift would be the location of the impressive mansion that she and John would erect in 1905, and a second home just next door east for Warren and Hester Langdon. <clears throat> so much could be said about John Langdon that you would be here until about eight o'clock tonight. Um, so, since I know I have to cut my talk, let's point out just a few accomplishments that were listed by Professor Lyman in his 1918 History of Old Walla Walla County. John Langdon re resigned from Baker & Baker to incorporate the Green Investment Company, and he served as president following the death of his stepmother, or his mother-in-law, excuse me, in 1911. He was joint owner of the Baker Langdon Orchard Company, saw a photograph of him standing there a minute ago. It was a 600-acre apple orchard uh, south of the city limits where South 3rd Avenue ends. There is nothing there today that can be seen of the orchard, but the cross street at the end of South 3rd is Langdon Road, named for John Langdon. He was director and vice president of the Baker Boyer National Bank. He was vice president of the Blaylock Fruit Company <clears throat> It was the largest uh, fruit and vegetable farm in the Northwest with extensive holdings in College Place. He was director of the Northwestern Fruit Exchange of Seattle and New York. He was president of the Walla Walla Park Board where he was considered the father of the park system. And he was the planner of the park, as Susan mentioned, uh, that was created on the 40-acre tract owned by uh, the city initially named City Park, but since 1931 known as Pioneer Park. He was appointed by Herbert Hoover, before Hoover was president, as chairman of the Food Conservation Program. He was an inventor. He secured a patent in 1903 for, for, an, for an, an improved uh, fountain pen. And keep in mind, he got an award for penmanship when he was a student. In 1925, he received a patent for a valve to provide more efficient bottling for gaseous beverages. He was a talented artist. He was perhaps even a more talented photographer with a number of copyrighted photographs, some of which are in the collection of the Library of Congress. We'll see a few samples of his photos. This one is a 1950 photograph of an indigenous uh, encampment entitled In the Gloaming. This is a copyrighted photo from 1914 of Mountain Queen, Dorsey Baker's locomotive for the Walla Walla and Columbia River Railroad. 
you go around the corner of this building when you leave, you will see it. <coughs> this is another 1914 photo of a Yakima woman. I will not attempt to pronounce her native name. And this is a famous 1915 photograph of a Okanagan woman who was known as Morning Dove, and that's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, Dove. There. This is an article on John Langdon that appeared in the Walla Walla Bulletin in June of 1922. At the time, and mind you, this is four years after Lyman's book, so a, a few more accomplishments. Um, at the time, At the time, John was a Whitman College trustee, and among numerous other endeavors, um, or among numerous other endeavors. And note at the bottom right, the little farmer who is looking up and saying, Langdon is our best booster. These are two photographs published by Booknook at the Langdon home. P photo part postcards, I should say. They're similar, but slightly different. Look at there on the second floor, you'll see what appears to be a sleeping porch. This is a current shot of Warren and Hester Langdon's home, which is now a Tau Kappa Epsilon fraternity, or Teak House. Note the strong similarity to John and Felinda's house. The original house extended right only through the main gable. The uh, fraternity acquired the house to the east. You can see just a peak of it there and connected the two houses. This is an early photo from up to the times. <clears throat> Uh, was taken from John and Felinda's house, looking across the gardens toward Warren and Hes Hester's house. And as usual, the omnipresent uh, boys are in this photo as well. This is a beautiful photograph, I think, that was taken across the cow path that served as Isaac's Avenue at the time. It includes both of the houses, and between the two houses to the rear, you can see um, Oh, what is it? Oh, Theta Theta, no, no, no. How, uh, Phi Delta Theta, sorry. Fraternity facing Estrella Street. Now we're going to jump ahead a few years and I will backtrack a bit. This is a 1925 photo taken on the front porch of the Phi Mu sorority sisters. And note behind them, the front door to the house is really quite narrow and it's no longer there. Upon completion of Prentice Hall the following year in 1926, Phi Mu moved into that building and the Lang Langdon house remained empty for a year and Phi Mu disbanded its Whitman chapter in 1955. This is a, Whit or a, a Whit the Whitman chapters, excuse me, of Beta Theta Phi fraternity was chartered in 1916 and it was located initially at 412 Isaacs Avenue, which is what you see in this photograph. That house has since demolished. This 1918 photo was taken at the earlier location, and Whitman's most famous graduate, class of 1920, may be seen. And it's rather long, but it is so dismissive that I've got to read part of it. Visit by J.C. Olmsted, 14th December, 1906. Mr. Langdon is one of the park commissioners, president in fact, and is the pushing active member. On this account, I yielded to his repeated requests to look at his place. It is a small place with a frontage of 150 feet or 200 feet 
on the street that bounds the Whitman College land. His house is an aggressively picturesque and ornate one in a freestyle, but not very bad. He had a little brook behind it. He has filled in thousands of loads of earth. In a hollow next to the street, he has leveled a sunken garden by partly filling a swamp and cutting into banks. Got a plan from the Portland, Oregon nursery man. I'm not sure what that reference is to, but it doesn't sound very nice. Just back of this, he has raised a great mound. He brings the brook along its southeast side from his father's place like an irrigating canal and then drops it down about six feet or so in a stiff waterfall. The whole thing is, quote, play into the gallery, unquote, as it is intended to be seen by people on the street. And probably it is expected that strangers will gasp and exclaim, the man who did that must have been a successful businessman. Now he is stuck as to what to do with the mound. He intended to cover it with flower beds, but being above the water, it is a good deal of bother and expense to water it. He asked me a great many detailed questions, too numerous to record. As the place was practically completed, and as I was only a short time on the place, I concluded to take him as president of the park board. No charge. End quote. In 1908, Mary F. Green moved into the Langdon home where she remained until her death in 1911. Warren Langdon died in 1915, and in 1921, John and Belinda, their sons grown by then, moved in with Hester Langdon and sold their mansion to the Board of Trustees of Whitman College. Initially known as Langdon House, it was used for a time as a women's dormitory. As I mentioned earlier, it was then later used for a while as five or five moved sorority. At some point following completion of Clinton Court Apartments in 1922, John and Felinda took an apartment in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that building. Oh, here is the talk about the construction of the house. How did it get there? How did the pictures get so far ahead? This just keeps getting. So we have actually seen all of the now, or then and now photographs. Oh, okay, that's right, I told you to hold it, yes. Okay, this is an old photograph, okay. Well, you, I guess you've been looking at the old photograph for a while. The two boys are both in that, one of them is standing on the mound and the other one is sitting on the bridge over Butcher Creek, which ran through the property, but it's no longer. Now. There is no creek there. Okay, this is the same view now. That little craftsman cottage was not a Langdon property. That dates from after the Langdons had sold the property, but it sits atop that mound that he created. And you can see right there is the bridge that ran over the now dry Butcher Creek. And there is a close-up of the bridge, and if I thought the fireplace, the library fireplace contemporary shot was a really nice thing, nice photograph. This is a really sad photograph. It's just totally overgrown and all the chunk under it. Okay, now, this is, these are just the very few photographs that John took upstairs. This is a bedroom with press brick fireplace. This is a bathroom with toilet, wash stand, and probably it's the one with the very large bathtub, although he didn't. Okay, and this is, I think, my last slide. This is something that I found in Teak House next door, the Warren and uh, Hester Langdon home. It was hanging on a wall in one of the boys' rooms, and it was drawn by Theron Smith, the late Theron Smith, famous Walla Walla architect. Um, it was a proposed replacement for Teak House. It wasn't dated, it probably is dated, but the right side of it had been kind of crudely cut off. It was on hardware and just hanging on a wall. So I don't know the data. I did show it to one of Smitty's daughters and she had never seen it before and didn't know that he'd even designed such a thing. You can see, well, I think it, it is a much more satisfactory design than the one that attached to the former Langdon Mansion next door. Um, and you can see that it uses some of the volcanic rock. And I really liked these balconies that you could walk around. In fact, you can see figures there on a couple of them. 
but it was never built, and it's, it's nice that the old house was preserved. Now, John Langdon had invested in a bottling plant at Clickitat Mineral Springs near Goldendale on the Columbia River, close to the Columbia River. And he had a contract with Safeway to bottle, to sell bottled flavored sodas. He also had hoped to develop some kind of a spa in partnership with his grown sons. The timing was not propitious. The stock market crashed in 1929, October 1929, coupled with poor sales of flavored sodas resulted in significant financial loss to Langdon. On August 25th, 1930, John Langdon was to have had dinner with his brother. Instead, he wrote two notes, one to Belinda and one for publication. He mentioned in the note for publication, or perhaps both of them, that he had had a good life, he treasured his family, but the click attack collapse had been overwhelming. He shot himself while sitting in his car. He was only 59 years old. His death was front page on the Spokane Daily Chronicle. His service at St. Paul's was one of the largest in history. A petition to rename City Park Langdon Park circulated and gathered a lot of signatures, but it was not to occur. And instead, the following year, 1931, as I mentioned, the park was renamed Pioneer Park. One of John's sons succeeded him as director of the Green Investment Company. And that is the end. And I ran a bit overboard. Thank you. I ran overboard because that machine kept breaking.